maybe I was just seeing it. I have no idea. It's so hard to tell. I can't ever tell until we go back and actually watch it. I think we're I think we're live now. Okay, we're live. Let's give it a second. Let's see if no, we don't have to give it a second. Hey everybody. Hi. What's up? Scotty. Hey, everyone. This, this is Scott Bryan, our apparel director. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, guys. It's uh, it's really so cool. It's such an honor. I took a look at the map um, this morning at how many people in different countries around the world are watching these live streams. And it just like totally blew my mind. I mean, it made my day. Um, it's really awesome to hang out with you guys and, uh, do this twice a week. It's just been really, really fun for us. So tonight we're going to dive into our apparel. I'll kind of give you a rundown of what the meeting will look like now. And then I have a couple of housekeeping items that we'll go through before we get started. Um, nice job, by the way, getting the link going tonight, Ash. That oh, was, that was the most seamless <laughs> we've had yet. I guess that was the least stressful so far. Um, yeah, so this is our fifth live stream. I can't oh. believe it. Can you believe that, guys? That's incredible. It's crazy. Hard to believe. Yeah, it's hard to believe. I, I had never ever done one of these until we did our first one. Yeah, yeah it's this really is my crazy. first one. Yeah, it is. welcome, yeah. Scotty. Oh, yeah, it's just like having a conversation, except people are watching. And yeah, listen, just like our weekly meeting, except for. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's just like all of our other Zoom meetings that we're doing every day. Yeah. I watched uh, I watched the one with Andrew and I spoke to my computer several times thinking I really? was in a meeting. I was like, You're the <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. That's actually one of the things. So quickly, I'm going to run through the housekeeping so that we can get started with our normal conversation. One of the things I wanted to touch on was that product development meeting that we did. For those of you that tuned in, uh, thank you for that with Andrew Wildcat uh, a couple of weeks ago, or I guess that was just last week, week before. I don't know. Anyway, we did a follow up. We weren't able to get to all of the questions. We had like 80 or so uh, questions that were not answered. So it was really cool. Pete, Andrew, and I sat down and just did like a total follow up, went through all of the details and answered your questions. So I'll post that YouTube video later this week. And we'll do the same thing tonight. We won't be able to get to all of the questions that you guys ask. So all of those that are left over, I'll go back afterwards. And then Scott, Pete, and I will do a follow up meeting and uh, we'll record that through Zoom and post it onto YouTube. So don't be worried if we don't get to your question tonight. And then uh, something that the team and I were kind of talking about today was doing a little community spotlight during every episode and like highlighting a couple of different like industry efforts or a couple of different businesses that we might be able to support those of us who have jobs and are still thriving during this uh, time of uncertainty. So this week I wanted to bring up Kate's Real Food. Uh, Kate's is definitely an awesome product for anyone who hasn't had it. They're delicious bars, really good ingredients, and they're offering right now um, some free bites with any order of bars. So go to katesrealfood.com and just stoke them out. I think they're like 25 bucks per box. So if you have yeah. the cash, yeah, go for it. Um, and then secondly, the BDR, that's an obvious one. If you have some extra cash, this is a great time to go support the BDR. It's There's nothing better that you can do really uh, for our sport and just getting more people um, into riding. So yeah, that's kind of it for the housekeeping. And then as far as the meeting, I think we're just gonna have a little conversation right now, just get to know Scotty a little bit. For those of you who don't know him, obviously we know Scotty really well. Um, but after that, we will dive into a sneak peek on the apparel and we'll open up the meeting after that to you guys and let you join just like normal. So I'll post the link for Zoom and yeah, that's it. <laughs> awesome, cool. Well, Scotty, thanks for making the time to come on. I know you got your hands full right now at home with the Lauren and the baby and stuff like that. And My pleasure. It's good to get out of the house. And your garden and God knows how many other side projects and home improvement and mountain biking, the trails just opening, everything else. Um, but it's neat. I think this is a really cool opportunity to, uh, for, um, you know, to kind of get uh, you guys out in front of a bunch of customers. You know, the live streams, it's like a really new format for us. And obviously you get out to a show a year, a couple shows a year, but um this is a chance for some folks that maybe don't make it to those shows to get to know you a little better. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm going to give just a little bit of context for how you joined Moscow. And then we want to, I want to talk about your background a little bit. Sure. You know, my, my perspective. Uh, so let's see, you joined <laughs> us, what about two, it's been two years now. <clears throat> yeah. Two years. Yeah. Two years ago. And we had been working on apparel literally since 2013, I think is when Andrew and I had our first apparel meeting. And so we've been working on it for four years and the product had been through two different, the hands of two different designers uh, and two different factories and was sort of really stuck in a rut. And we were more committed than ever to the, the category, but we were really struggling with how to, how to make the leap. And, um, and then you came on board. And since then the apparel just like immediately kicked into high gear. 
And now we are in the apparel business. We're rolling. We've got a full product development pipeline. We've got a great factory relationship. So you, you were like this magician that sort of came in from the outside and like fixed our fucked up process and got us back on track and, and, and took all the things we've been talking about, dreaming about and, and put them into reality. So that's, that's a little, just a little bit of context from my perspective as the owner. Um, but, um, but so let's, let's uh, go back a little bit and start kind of at the beginning and just talk about like where you're from and kind of what kind of kid you were and um, just your, your early background, sort of yeah. free, free education. Okay. So um, I'm originally from Oshawa, Ontario uh, in Canada, which is just east of Toronto. Uh, which is like pretty, pretty big city for anyone who knows, knows Canada. Um, and yeah, just, it's kind of a suburb now. It was kind of a bigger city. Well, it was not attached there before. Now it's just, everyone's just like, oh, I live in Toronto. You're like, no, that's 45 minutes outside of downtown. <laughs> does not count. Um, so born there um, was just, I don't know, just like regular kid. Didn't really get into like ball sports or anything like that. I was just, I was horrible. I still can barely throw, um, but sort of got into skateboarding. Uh, when snowboarding became about, I was just all in on that, uh, wakeboarding. So these sort of like action sports really kind of captured my attention and, and that's what I put a lot of my energy into. Uh, went on to become like a snowboard instructor, wakeboard instructor was my summer jobs for pretty much most summers after I was probably like 15 years old. Yeah, probably about then before I could drive. Um, and then from there, I was really into art in high school. And so I applied to a bunch of different art colleges, art universities across Canada. Um, and one of them happened to be Emily Carr in Vancouver, which is the same school Andrew went to actually. Um, so funny. This is kind of the first really of several crazy. parallels between your and yeah, Andrew. <laughs> but you didn't know Andrew at that time. I didn't know. And I actually wanted to go because they had an animation program, um, nothing to do with design. I was just like, they have an animation program. They're in Vancouver, checks two boxes. If I get in, I'm gone. That was yeah. it. That's all I knew. I'd never even been there. Um, so I got in and I packed my bags and I, I went out west. Um, and that's that was kind of like really opened it up. I mean, at, at that point, the main interest was snowboarding and skiing. I was snowboarding at the time there. Um, but no mountain bikes at that stage, you no mountain bikes at that stage. I remember actually, I remember my early years, uh, at Emily Carr, you'd be hanging out with like the guys in the video, um, video arts department, media arts, and you'd go to their house and they'd be like playing these, like on these big screens, just like crazy downhill videos from the North shore. That was all like just getting going at that time. Cause this is like, uh, 2000 to 2004 were my, my college years. And, um, it was just really ramping up in a big way. And I remember seeing it being like, that is the craziest sport. Why would you ever fucking do that? I would never do that. I would never do that. And this was when they're doing skinnies, like 20 feet off the ground and just like, yeah, dangerous dance stuff. Anyways, um, four years later, I bought my first downhill mountain bike and I've been biking ever since. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's not a that's not a hard like transition to go from like downhill mountain biking to riding moto you're like oh this is sick i can go yeah. way farther <laughs> I, mean, oh, man. I don't know if people people are familiar with with the downhill mountain bike thing but i mean what these guys do and scotty included is just completely bonkers the, some of the jumps and ramps and these incredible like skinny little uh yeah. sort of what do you call it like a uh, balance beam yeah made out of wood it's like way up off the ground i'm not gonna lie. The trees it's totally not so much of that happens anymore but when when i started riding i was pretty into that stuff and man it was it's a trip i'm I mean, serious the only reason that we haven't ridden together i was thinking earlier today i was like god is it true like i've never ridden mountain bikes with scotty and then i was like oh no i'm too scared i'm like oh, such a, i'm like such a puss i won't go with you <laughs> might chat your ear off if we're going too slow but dude no i cannot that stresses me out if people are talking like i can't run if i'm hearing myself breathing i'm like mm, i gotta no yeah, i gotta i gotta shut this down i gotta just shut it down <laughs> so you got so a couple of things happened one you got into trail sports in vancouver and two at some point you made the, the transition just kind of similar to andrew from being wanting to be an artist to wanting to be a designer yeah so i, I kind of skimmed over that part because i was trying to focus on the kind of kid i was rather than the school um uh -huh. deal but yeah i showed up at, at college and so the first years, like they call it foundation, do like a little bit of everything. Um, and I had a buddy that I moved out West with, um, that it, he was a year ahead of me and he was in the design program. 
he was in second year when Andrew was in fourth year and I was in my first. Um, never crossed paths with Andrew. Didn't cross paths. You didn't That's know each other. Not... And if I did, it was like we would not like we were not in the same circles at all. He was on his way really? out, on, on my way in. Um, How big of a school is Emily Carr? The design. Not part. a big school, but design was like kind of tucked away in a corner. And at at his time, I think there was only like less than ten students in the design department. Wow. Um, the year that my friend was in, I think it was like twenty, and the year I was in was like twenty eight or. It's tiny. Oh it's Wade, tiny. Scotty Wade Wade Olson says that you're a spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, do, I do my best to live up to that. <laughs> um, so, so what uh, what uh, prompted that that sh that that sort of shift from art to design for you? You know, I just I kept seeing what my buddy was doing a year ahead of me, um, and uh, Emily Carr is lucky enough they actually have a backpack design class. Um, mm -hmm. And so he was showing me some of the stuff and eventually he got to making this backpack. Um, and I was like, man, this stuff all seems like way more interesting than like coming up with these statements about society and like pouring out your passion. It's just, I'm not very good at it. I wanted to be an animator. I just wanted to draw some pictures of cool robots like that. Was cool. <laughs> so um, all of a sudden I, I kind of shifted my interest. I applied to the program. Um, I got in and then that really like, Blew, blew my mind of, of where you could go with design. Like it wasn't just furniture and cell phones. It was all these sports products that, that I loved um, that you could, you could make and, and focus on. Um, yeah, basically designing your life to get you in front of the sports and thinking about the sports that you like and um, are passionate about instead of being chained to a desk, chained to a computer and drawing the same repetitive thing again and again and again to make it move. You're, so you're getting out doing the thing and then yeah. thinking about how you can make gear that's going to make the experience better and make people enjoy it, right? Yeah, it's it's just, it's been a good decision. It's served me well and there, it's led me to have some pretty amazing experiences like out testing gear with, with some top athletes and um, just getting out in places um, and doing things, people often question. They're like, "That was that was for work," and you're like, "No, yeah. <laughs> we, um, we had to go heli skiing this weekend <laughs> because I've never done it." And at the time, a, a company I worked for made products for it, so you have to at least know what you're talking about. Hey, totally, yeah. You can't design the products without doing the thing. No, that's, that's the nature of these of these sports. Um, so you're, uh, so you, you got into design and where did you go after uh, university? So you got out, you got your degree. So I got out, got my degree. Um, I applied to all like my favorite brands, um, and kept getting the same response that everyone always gets. Um, your resume looks great, but you have no experience. Hmm. Resume looks great, you have no experience. Applied to Arc'teryx, I applied to Dekine, I applied to Burton, all these like top, um, well, in my opinion at the time I was like, all oh, these are all the best places I need to work there. And, um, what was like your number one? What was like your dream? Dream was Arc'teryx for sure. Um, that's the top. And I mean, Dekine was right up there and made that one come true. And Burton was also, I mean, I was mainly a snowboarder at the time. So those were like my three, my three big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I applied to some smaller, smaller brands as well. And it always just came back the same way. And, and so um, I, just decided to do contract design. I was like, fine, well, if I need experience, I'll make experience. And um, I did logo design. I did some website interactive design stuff. I did um, any, anything that would pay the bills. It was just like, I chomped it. Anyone said, I need to design this. I'd be like, I'm in. Um, <laughs> and eventually a glove contract came across my desk. And I was like, well, glove. It was a golf glove, actually. It was a golf glove for golfing in the rain. Um, and it wasn't a very exciting brand, but it, it was going to pay. And so I took it and, um, through that, I actually met a manufacturer, um, who liked, who liked my stuff. The project that we were working on was too small to, um, low MOQs to be entertained, which I didn't understand why they wouldn't want to make it at the time. Um, now I understand it all too well. Mm. And, and they, they like my stuff. So they asked me to do more work for them. They're like, well, we have a couple outdoor brands and action sport brands. We think your stuff would be great for. So I started doing contract for a company called Tabar um, up in Bellingham, Washington. And so through them, I was exposed to brands like Mountain Hardware, Outdoor Research, Race Face, Mountain Biking, 
um, who else did I work on? Dekine was actually going through them at the time. Um, and so I, I just kind of, I built my own experience. And from there, I, I moved down to Hood River and got a job at Dekine. What happened yeah. to Kine? To Kine found you through this other company and was like, you were interested? Yeah, Did you yeah they were. Um, a lot of names, you know, like all like all at once to be like, wow, I worked on all of these brands. It's And it's really fun to be somewhere like that where you can, because totally. a glove is kind of a glove. And so just have to put it through different filters um, instead of just putting a logo on it. You have to like kind of be like, okay, what are these guys about? What are these guys about? It's really actually a fun exercise. Um, yeah. And yeah, so through there, I met the Dekine design team and they were like, who's this, who's this guy who's like participating in meetings and they're like, um, he's a contractor from BC. So one of them uh, actually invited me down for an interview. And uh, that's when I first saw Hood River and the Gorge and yeah, it's pretty much sold. Well, so you're, let's, let's, uh, we, we're, so that we can, we're going to move on and start talking about products in a few minutes, but let's, there's a few interesting steps in your career that we should talk about. Sort of, and it, it, the career roughly goes to Kine, Patagonia, to Kine, Moscow. Yeah. Right. So give us the, could you give us kind of the, the big picture on that and the transitions and, and, uh, and, and also our first introduction? Yeah. yeah and, absolutely. and I have one question about Moscow after that. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll um, the transition was kind of interesting because, I obviously came in um, to Dekine as a glove guy. Um, I ran their glove division uh, for four and a half years uh, as, as a designer. I worked with two others on that category and um, it was super fun. We did mountain bike gloves, and snowboard gloves. Uh, I was kind of getting burnt out. I mean, gloves all have five fingers. The architectures, you once you figure out the insulation and articulation, there's not a lot. Um, there's not a lot you're doing at the level that Dekine plays at. There's definitely some fun design challenges in gloves, but I was getting, kind of getting burnt out and I, I wanted to uh, join Andrew on the pack side. I was like, okay, I want to do this. Um, and at that time, a buddy of mine at Patagonia was moving from equipment to apparel. And he's like, dude, you should throw your name in the hat down here. And um, Patagonia seemed really entertaining to me because they had, they had day packs, but they also had some technical packs and to them, I felt like their packs covered like a broader range. And so it seemed like the world would be my oyster if I went, went down there. And um, so I did, I had, I landed the job and, and headed down to Patagonia to run their equipment division, which was equ uh, equipment and accessories. So I did all their um, packs, luggage and accessories, which is headwear and handwear at the time, um, which, the handwear from Patagonia and Dekine are definitely two different levels. One you walk your dog in and the other one you're like shredding in. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like Patagonia is just like one of these, like it's like this iconic, oh, yeah. like legend of a company run by this guy, uh, Yvonne, am I saying his name, name right? Yvonne Trenard? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Nailed so, it. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, like, <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we tell we, him why I see it's easy. We've read his book, you know, <laughs> let my people go surfing. I mean, just absolutely incredibly inspirational guy. Like I don't, oh, yeah. you know, every, uh, I, I just think he, he's very, very impressive, super interesting background. So what an incredible opportunity for you as a designer. Oh, yeah. is also a legendary brand, but wow, Patagonia must've, did that knock your socks off a bit? How it, did you feel? It did. I mean, it's working at Patagonia is an amazing experience. Um, it's, like nothing else there's just so much support for the design team um incredible amount of resources for doing super cool stuff working with top athletes um, and really putting those athletes first you know a lot of people talk about the marketing of like oh our pros were in here and they gave us this feedback no like if it didn't pass a few people's litmus test it didn't happen and like and then you also have like the potential of yvonne yc walking in and being like what what is this this is garbage and you just the project could just be over you're just like well I, yeah can't he, argue with that great stories about him but i and, I just, he'd be, and he'd be mostly right he'd be like we don't need that yeah but yeah it was it was amazing and so um down there for four and a half years uh and was ready for a change and apparently andrew was too because andrew was starting up moscow moto with you um and created a a space at Dekine that needed to be filled with my expertise and so i moved back to the gorge just to highlight again, we've got the beginning, the beginnings in art, moving over to product design, the strong interest in non-motorized sports and outdoor activities, 
the working at Dekine, you're you come in in the gloves, he's in the backpacks, you say, Oh, I want to jump over to backpacks. And so, and then so there's that connection of you working in parallel there. There's Emily Carr Institute, yeah. and then and now there's this uh, Andrew leaves to start Moscow, creates a job opening at Dekine, and you come back from Patagonia and take over his job. Smaller world, even even smaller. I was actually in town for my wedding, and Andrew's like, You got to come in for an interview. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, you guys are like just on these, these like totally parallel paths. Yeah, it's too it's so, funny. Yeah. Uh, we have a really good question from the audience. So James wants to know what's your biggest challenge building products at Moscow? Like just sort of contrasting your your experience with Patagonia, with Dekine. Like what's the biggest challenge at the smaller company? Biggest challenge of the smaller company um, is just the horsepower. I mean, Going to somewhere like Patagonia, there's literally a, a person for every step of the way. And so a lot can happen in a short amount of time. Um, that, that changes a lot when you're in a small company because then you just wear all those same hats. So while you're uh, developing your ideas, you can't be designing the next season. Um, you can't be answering emails to a manufacturer while you're also sketching ideas for the next season. You can't do these things. So you have to spread out and balance your time in a whole different way rather than depending on um, this massive machine that can just, I mean, you just put a good idea in and like the machine kind of works and you balance it a little bit in the middle and it spits out and you're like, yeah, that's what I meant. Um, <laughs> here it's like, you have, you have to be the one cranking at every step of the way. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the biggest challenge. And then we're like, so do you have photos yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or I'm like, uh, hey, we need to like figure out how we're going to take pictures of this shit. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you've got, you've literally have written product descriptions for the website. I mean, yeah. you're, it's, I feel like uh, working for your role at Moscow, it's almost like you're an entrepreneur starting an apparel business as opposed to being, performing this one function in a much broader process, obviously with bigger numbers on it. At yeah. The companies but here it's like well welcome aboard scott it's like you're our apparel business development manager too you know yeah, yeah i mean it, it, in, in that sense it's also super fun because you have a lot of ownership and there's yeah. also in that big wheel there's things that you would always push against whether it's um uh design and line management not agreeing design and sales not agreeing on what's gonna sell and sales being too conservative and looking in the rear view mirror and design being too forward thinking and only want to make cool stuff that no one wants um yeah. So you have the, the that difficulty at a big company. Here, I feel like we kind of get on board with the idea and we're just all gun ho We can make anything happen. We're a super nimble ship. If the idea fails of Proto 3, there's like, well, let's start again. Yeah, back to, back to square one. So, yeah, so that's pretty amazing too. But but definitely time management is just a challenge at a small company. So why did you why did you make the decide to make the leap and join us at Moscow? Uh, it was pretty much for some of those same reasons is just um, at the machine. Uh, you just feel like you're always kind of putting in your two cents. And if it's not listened to, you can't, you can't say, see, I told you so. So here I, I took on all that responsibility and I was willing to like um, take those risks to be like, okay, these guys are doing something cool. Um, sounds like they want to go in a, a, a new direction, which working with top materials, top quality product, uh, emphasis on design first, all these things are like, I mean, it's like a designer's dream you're, um, to create a new category as well. It's not like um, you're battling it out in a super um, protected space, you know, it's not like another ski jacket. It's like a, a little twist on what we're doing. Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the neat things uh, about the selling direct is that we we don't have, although our volumes are low, some of our competitors in apparel have much higher volumes, so they have a cost advantage on us there. Our competitors also sell through distribution. They have retailers or distributors, which take a huge piece of the margin away. And so we have, we don't have that margin pressure, which means that we don't have to spend hours debating over an extra dollar and a cost on a zipper or some material we want to use that costs a few dollars more a yard. That would be an enormous sum, right, at, at, yeah. at Patagonia or Dekine. For us, it's like, yeah, whatever. Do you like it? Yeah. Okay, let's use it. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The um, the retail formulas at those companies are much more sophisticated because it fifty cents will make a will make or break a retail margin, um, and can make or break a product. That's why I feel like so many of them have such similar looking products. 
Mm -hmm. you know, in, in yeah, outdoor industry, you know, it's like, they're all, they're all saddled with the same economics and the, the same couple of factories and the same it's, basic materials. How different can it be? It's well, almost also, like, go ahead, Scotty. Also too, it's like, has to do with like line architecture. When you have, you know, 20 jackets or 20 backpacks, you've got to be pretty specific about what makes each one better than the next. Mm -hmm. um, and here we have a pretty much blank slate. I mean, we only have six pieces in our apparel line currently. We're going to be adding uh what another six and that's still i mean only 12 styles and apparel is pretty wide open blank slate so we don't have to be like well this one has five pockets and this one has two you right. know you don't have to play that game yet but um when you're those big companies it you're really kind of nitpicking on what makes the other one more expensive so you're you you have this really interesting background in outdoor and one of the sports we didn't we didn't mention that you're into also is this kind of backcountry hunting which I think is is super oh, cool. Oh yeah, we should totally. But, talk. but uh, I mean, let's well, talk about that for okay, a couple okay. minutes. Like, yeah. yeah, we I mean, think talking about brands that we admire or companies that we look to for design inspiration or even marketing inspiration. I mean, Kuyu is definitely one of those. So yeah, absolutely. Who yeah. doesn't know Kuyu? Scotty, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, Kuyu is is basically a top quality uh, direct consumer hunting brand for ultralight backpack hunting um, and mostly focus on like backcountry sheep hunting, although their stuff's really great for a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, and they were kind of um, a broken partner partnership between um, Sitka and they spun off and did a direct to consumer version uh, with some amazingly thoughtful camouflage patterns, really nice high-end materials from Japan. Um, and just really attacked it on like top quality and, and direct to consumer pricing. And it's, it's really amazing stuff. It's my favorite stuff that I use um, in the backcountry when I go. And as, as I think some people know, Jason, the founder of that company was a huge uh, inspiration to us in starting Moscow and very generous with his time in terms of uh, helping us think about our, our DTC business strategy and stuff like that. So it's a company that we feel have uh, really nice feelings about, but, um, yeah. but you, so you have all this incredible background in, in uh, outdoor, both as a, as a uh, as a consumer, you know, as somebody who who really does the stuff, you know, the the, the uh, downhill mountain biking and backcountry skiing and backcountry ultralight hunting and backpacking, all of the different and mountain you know mountain biking. I said already all the things you do. Um, so you you weren't really big in moto. You were sort of moto curious when we met. And, yeah. Uh, and and I think we we took a look at you and said, okay, you know, I think when this guy says he's really interested in moto. We believe him because look at he's got all the prerequisites right lined up and uh and of course that's turned out to be true you just got your first dirt bike you've had a dual sport bike for two years now you've done a bunch of trips you commute on it every day but um so i'm just building all that base to ask you the question of you know coming into the adventure motorcycle industry with that perspective uh what do you see in terms of the product that's out there what's your take on the market on the apparel the sort of standard adventure kit that's kind of out there from a bunch of different manufacturers these with the pockets and all the things what maybe give us your perspective on all that yeah so being an outsider coming in um i mean like pete said i've only been at this for about two years um bought my first bike and it was a drz 400 so on the smaller side in the space um and really what i what i see with this sort of standard adventure kit is everything sort of is an evolution of like the touring kit. Everything is an evolution of the road kit. It's like we were doing it this way for so long, but then we wanted to get um, off-road curious. And then we made it a little more rugged and a little more of this, but it's still very much based in just what you need uh, for road travel. Um, just, you know, road touring, your kit doesn't seem much different. Um, so to me, the big opportunity is in this backcountry space is designing just for the backcountry just like backcountry ski gear is different than alpine ski gear i mean you look at the bindings they're like a completely different piece um if you go bike packing as well same thing you're not going to wear the same thing on a bike packing trip as you wear on a downhill mountain bike course it's just not the same um and then that would also draw the other analogy the other end of the spectrum is motocross which is um wildly popular or and it's just a different beast. The gear is built for a few races, a few seasons. It's not really um, built to last by any means um, and seems much more disposable. And so you have that end of the spectrum and then you have sort of the road touring end of the spectrum gear and they, the gear kind of makes the Venn diagram together. Um, and I think 
the opportunity really is is to target uh, backcountry travel specifically. Yeah, I, I feel like if I uh, when we I, talking about even going back to before you joined Moscow, uh, there we sensed we had this like angst with our ADB gear, like myself and my buddies and Andrew, and and, and so we weren't happy with the gear we had, but there wasn't really anywhere to look for like role models of like oh well this is what we want to be like you know you can yeah. see with the touring gear each garment is an evolution on something before it so you can say oh that one takes this part of its style from over here and this part of its function from over here and and uh but what we wanted to do was something that was like completely separated from that you know instead of the the in, in really intense sole focus on abrasion the temperature control through lots of vents instead of removing the jacket the integrated armor all the pockets for storing all sorts of stuff, which makes the jacket heavier and bigger and bulk. The, the, everything had been an evolution on that. And we were kind of coming and saying, we want something different, but we're not really sure what. And our, the only place we had to look for, for a role model was in other sports, you know, yeah. like backcountry skiing, cycling, which, mountaineering. Which is a great way to do design is look at, look at other sports, look at other industries, yeah. um, anything else. I mean, look at mountain biking, mountain biking, looked at motocross and they ended up with suspension. And now look right. at, you know, yeah. so, um, just by looking outside your industry can be a very powerful source of inspiration and a very powerful design tool. Yeah. yeah. Is that, it is interesting that mountain biking has taken so much inspiration from moto and now we're looking at sort of mountain, we look at mountain biking and are bringing it back into the, the motorsports industry. It is yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah, it's true. This is a great segue, I think, into what products we, we kind of have coming down the pike. Um, but first I want to, I, I want to just say a couple of things that's go, that are going on in the live chat and bring in a few questions that people are asking, because I think that we'll answer some of them in turn as we, as we go through some of these products. So it's really cool. People are asking for some of the stuff that we're working on. So that's a good sign. Yay. Um, yeah. A couple of things before I get to the specific product questions. So one person uh, asked about budget options, and I think that we should just take a second to touch on, um, you know, why we choose premium materials, why we choose like premium build and quality and fit and finish over offering budget options. Um, and will we ever offer them for, you know, what the, the question was for the 99% of people who yeah. want that. Well, what's your budget? That's the <laughs> yeah. question. So, um, yeah, I mean, for top quality goods, it's like you go the cheap route, you spend twice as much. And, and, and one thing to keep in mind, I think here, it's really noteworthy. A lot of people don't understand that when you're buying through the retail model, when you're not buying from a direct sales company, you are buying a much more expensive product, even if the, the cost off the shelf to you is quite a bit cheaper than what you're paying for uh, for our gear. It's a lot more expensive. The manufactured cost is maybe a, a fourth or a sixth of what you're paying. You know? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that half the price of the jacket they just bought is is being kept by the retailer, and that's just the price of literally getting it to their town and having it waiting for them on a shelf. Yeah, and I mean, like our goal, our goal is not, um, our goal is not to just design expensive stuff. That's never our goal. We're, but the beauty of working at Moscow, which is another reason that seems so um, appealing to a designer, was that. We're going to design it first, make it up to our specifications that we fulfill all of our desires for the project to do, and then this is what it costs. And yeah. so we're not like looking away and like, oh, we're going to make an eight hundred dollar this or this. There's no, there's no discussion of price until the end. And then sometimes we're like, whoa, oh, yeah. maybe, yeah, so, that, whoa, we got it, a little it, crazy it, there. But sometimes. <laughs> More often than not, it comes yeah. in being pretty economical. And no, it does. We never, but... we never play this pricing game of which they talk about in business school and stuff like that, of like sitting around and figuring out what customers will pay. Right. We never yeah. price that no. way. We take our cost, we put our margin on it, and that's it. That's how we price it. We price off cost. And the, the thing that has been really eye-opening for me about this apparel design process is recognizing how much materials drive the cost. I don't think... I really understood that in the kind of core way I do now until I started seeing bills and materials for jackets and realizing like, it's not the factory's labor. It's not our market. It is one, like the difference between the $130 uh, waterproof jacket you get at big five and the $750 jacket you get from Arcteryx is 110% materials. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the difference in price, they, I mean, they both have two sleeves. They both have a neck opening. They both have a front zip. They both have pockets. They both have a waist opening. Like, that they look they're the same if on yeah. paper and right? a lot of people i mean especially coming from the equipment space there's a lot of amazing packed fabrics um for really affordable prices so it's like that's 
and they kind of just do what you want them to. They're, they're super uh, abrasion resistant, super tough, super tear resistant. Um, you know, you can kind of do some pretty great stuff with a basic material that's very affordable. We're talking like four to six, maybe eight dollars. I mean, mm -hmm. I think even those prices would scare uh, some big some big brands for sure. They'd be like, whoa, whoa get down in the four dollar range. Um, and you're talking apparel. I mean, some of our stuff's thirty two dollars a yard for super mm -hmm. fabric stuff like that. Like it gets pretty pricey pretty quick, and then you cover half the jacket in it. And, Right. A lot of people would see that the super fabric price and the 30 or $40 a yard and, and, and they would say, Oh, that's crazy. We're not going to use it. Or they would say, that's crazy. We're going to use it in a little patch on the elbow or a little patch on the knee. We took super fabric. I can see the jacket behind you. I mean, all the black from this all the way up the sleeve, all the way across the chest, all the way across the back, all the way down the other side, all super fabric. And another decision on that jacket, for example, is to continue the event fabric up underneath the super fabric. So it's not even like we just have super fabric there. We have super fabric over $18 a yard event. So you're yeah. at, you know, $50, so, $60 a yard. So that, I mean, we will be conscious of that stuff, but at the same yeah. time, we're still going to build what we really think the market needs and what we really want. Um, I and, love it. It's so simple, like on, on all of our apparel product pages, you'll see a, a line that says we never cut corners on design and that's with bags or apparel. We just don't. We build the best. We build the thing that when we're out on the trail, we're like, God damn, I wish I had this thing X, you know? Yeah. And then we or, it. or I really wish this thing didn't break or I really wish right. this thing yeah. right. kept the water yeah. out for a couple more yeah. hours longer, or, you know? So there's, that's, those are the design decisions we're making that, that does drive up the cost. and. Um, yeah, we appreciate yeah, cool. it. You guys I think we I think we went deep enough on that. We can keep going. I just kind of wanted to touch on it. Um, one other thing, this is really interesting. We don't need to talk about it, but Lauren has been giving us a lot of feedback in the live chat about uh, wanting camping gear. She wants a more thorough buying experience of the Moscow site. You know, knives, cook cookware, tents, all the stuff. So Lauren, we're not going to dive into this right now. We could do a whole other live stream on what we've got in the works, uh, but we are listening and we are definitely uh, working on that stuff. And then these next three things that I'm just going to mention, I think Scotty, uh, we don't need to answer the questions, but let's just keep these in mind kind of as you're going through the sneak peek. Uh, okay. I want to hand it over to you after I mention these questions. So Fred asked about a super vented mesh jacket. He loves the idea of the basilisk, but wants to know if we have anything in the works for a super vented mesh piece. Uh, Jirok asked for a set that doesn't look like a set, which is, I thought mm. that was a really interesting and awesome question because totally we have that. something yeah. super exciting. I think the the Woodsman, which you're about to introduce, yeah. Scotty, is just going to be like, I mean, for me, that's it. I'm like, oh man, if I just want a jersey that's like a Wolf Enduro jersey or a Fast House jersey, like the Woodsman pants, just you can rock anything with those, you know, they look awesome. Um, and then Jan asked about gloves. So I know that's your favorite topic. We yeah. can talk about that maybe at the end. We're taking you back to gloves, Scotty. Yeah. Yep. Gloves again, five cool. figures. Everyone tries to do it, no matter where I work. Most of you won't work on gloves. Let's do gloves, <laughs> yeah. But make them different. We don't want to be yeah. like anyone else's. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to throw those out there, but I think we should dive into the, the, to the sneak peek. And then um, maybe in like 15, 20-ish minutes, we'll open it up to the crowd and uh, see what feedback or what questions people have. OK, well, um, I have a pair of Woodsman's here, so I could kind of try and show you. Um, yeah. And then other than that, maybe we'll do like a screen share to show you guys like Those the liner. Yeah. That sounds great. I not think people as, will love it. Not to as exciting that. as being able to touch and feel it um, get out to the shows or yeah. us on the trail, but you yeah. know, we'll, we'll do our best. Yep. We totally miss seeing you guys at the shows for sure. God, it's so cool. There's like 200 people on right now. Hey, everybody. Hi, thanks <laughs> for chiming up? in, guys. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Sweet. Um, Woodsman. Yeah. Okay, the Woodsman. This. Take us through it, Scotty. High level first. Yeah. Okay. So you see the black patches and the brown patches. Okay, the brown is a 300D by 500D stretch nylon. Um, there's no membrane behind it. It's just um, like an Oxford weave like you'd see on a pair of Carhartts or um, something like that, but it is nylon. Um, so you get some added durability, some added tear strength, um, but no waterproofing other than DWR. So you get a little beading on the surface, but uh, if you get feet through, it could get wet, but that also means there's going to be a lot more airflow through here. Um, the black patches are shoulder sea change, three layer stretch 
material. So this is a waterproof, breathable stretch material in the knees, uh, which I call the splash zone, and then in the seat, because you know, you sit on a dewy seat in the morning, you don't want that water coming through, uh, or after going through a rowdy stream crossing, you wanna be uh, comfortable and dry. This pant is, we're kind of uh, calling it like the 90% pant, because 90% of the time on your rides, you're gonna be comfortable and super satisfied with this pant. You can pair, pair it with a deluge, uh, then you end up with a waterproof, light packable system, or uh, we also have some other pants coming out in the future that would also work with this, because uh, then you have a fully waterproof system for when you need it, and they're super comfortable riding um, pant for when you don't. You have uh, full-size thigh vents with mesh lining in the side, so you get some flow-through venting. Uh, we have cargo, let's see if you can see these. We have cargo pockets on top of the thigh uh, with a hideaway vent in the, in the gusset. So that's pretty awesome. Um, hand pockets for when you're off the bike, an adjustable waist. Um, these are designed to be worn with a belt also, not required because we have the adjustability, but uh, yep. like a lot in, of the belt loops. Um, in the boot cut. So that's another big thing. So these are um, kind of the ultimate dual sport pan as well. You could wear them on a, on a trail day riding, a big, big enduro ride. Uh, you could wear them um, ADV riding. I wore them on our last uh, company trip in the fall. I pretty much lived in them nonstop. We were on a desert trip, so there was no pre sipping. I was so jealous. Out. They're pretty comfortable. Well, you were just wearing them all the time. So that was the one trip that I decided to not bring any pants other than my basilisk, which are like pretty comfortable. But I don't, I don't have the motivation to like take off my knee pads and stuff when the pants aren't that much more comfortable without them. So I was yeah. just like, sitting around. I was like, oh, you look so comfortable in this woodsman. No, and, and, and I brought fleece pants for underneath. So around the oh, fire. Yeah. Cozy. I think cozy. that was part of our, our, I mean, this originally came from, we were talking about dirt bike pants and how would we make a good dirt bike pant for tour, but that was for touring, like enduro touring. And you had the idea of why don't we look at soft shell materials from cross country skiing. And that was like this yeah. aha moment that just like yeah. everybody was like, boom, we got to try that. Well, and it was a little more hardcore than that. It was alpine climbing. Come alpine on. climbing. Oh, right. Yeah. And, yeah, right. And then you... you but so I do you, wear my I, woodsman cross-country skiing. And uh, that was this huge, like, aha moment. And then we started asking ourselves, why, uh, why do we wear waterproof gear all 100%? This is the only sport where you wear waterproof rain gear all the time, even when it's not raining. It's crazy. In most other sports, like, when it stops raining, you take your rain gear off. In motorcycling, you wear rain gear all the time. Yeah, you yeah. have people in Southern California who are riding like 99% of their riding season in the sunshine, beautiful, like 70 degree weather. I mean, cool in the evenings, but it's not raining out there. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely saw that um, coming from, from outdoor. I was just like, why are we wearing this stuff all the time? I never go backpacking in rain pants just because it's in the forecast. Um, and stopping to pull on a pair of overpants is not that big a deal if you've been way more comfortable for the rest of the ride. So I want to I want to mention this question, Ron Bro, which I love this because it comes right in line with the story of this product and sort of the process that we went through. Like, okay, first, you know, are waterproof or, or waterproof? Is it necessary? Do we need any of those patches? Um, the next thing that we went through was the over the boot or in the boot question. Like, what do we do? Okay, so we made this. We made a pant that was over the boot. Right? Yeah, it started as an over the boot pant. Yeah, yeah um, let's talk about this. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about it. Let's Why? Get into it. Over the boot or in the boot? Why? Frozen yeah. And then anybody who feels all angsty about this, join when I post the link, join and let's like, let's, you know. We know we're going to get an earful let's on haggle. this. So let's haggle. Yeah, oh, totally. Um, <laughs> you know, what it came down to is because we wanted to make like a true dual sport pant um, and a lot of our testing happened trail riding, it was really hard to find a suitable material that was like durable enough, had the stretch, didn't just build up and bulk up the pant that could stand up to being caught between your bike and your boot, which are just, it's a rock and a hard place. And a soft, supple fabric, Literally. even yeah. the most durable fabric. I mean, we, some of our competitor samples that we have over the years that um, people towed is like their favorite pants they rode in. Pete, you had a pair of pants that, that you really liked and it was, built from, yeah. it was built for much, um, much more rugged fabric, but it still had the same problems because it was an out of the boot pant. Um, and so we, after a 
a few prototypes we were just like let's let's shift lanes let's put it in and see if, if we can we can do this and um, and i just want to i just want to clear up for anyone we will have over the boot pants still in our we're pocket. not changing everything it's we're just not changing everything. Hand. this is just a, the woodsman we decided to go in this direction with the woodsman pants specifically and it pairs really well with an over the boot pant that we already the have other, in our line the yeah. other thing that is important to note is the woodsman's not waterproof there's waterproof patches so it's called like a hybrid design as a waterproof knee and a waterproof seat just just to keep you more comfortable on on a, a ride where you might be crossing a lot of streams it happens a lot in the northwest um but still get that airflow. So if you don't have a waterproof pant, why are you putting it on the outside of the boot? Um, basically, if the water is gonna go down your leg and you're, you don't have water in your lap, or sorry, if you don't have water protection in your lap, then you're gonna be soaked anyways. Um, basically, a waterproof pant makes more sense on the outside. Yeah, so we, we pair this with an overpant. So the overpant is an over the boot, and then this inner more comfortable pant that's also, you know, also the more durable. Uh, and the reason we go non-waterproof instead of waterproof is basically that no matter how many vents and holes and zippers and stuff you cut in a membrane, which by the way, all uh, compromises the, the um, waterproofing of the membrane when you cut all those holes in it. But anyway, you cut all those holes in it because it's hot, because membranes, even the best, even event, even the best vented membranes are going to be much hotter than a non-waterproof pan. Mm -hmm. And that's why wearing a waterproof pant all the time kind of sucks if you don't have to, right? These are just yeah. so much more comfortable. The stretch uh, and the ventilation. And it's is possible so that in the future- Can we'll I go ahead and share the-, the, the Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Here, just so yeah. we can talk while we're going. So here's the, so we're not waking white pants. Don't get confused. <laughs> I love that. That would be interesting. This is, this is, this is just the technical drawing to show everyone sort of let the lines because sometimes on this people's screens the colors will mess it up like you can't see any lines on the black one here. Um, so if you zoom in here, you can see our adjustable waist that I showed you uh, hand pockets and we have our cargo pockets with these hidden gusseted uh, vent pockets. So you unzip that and that's uh, mesh lined. Um, double stitch reinforcement on the crotch with the extra bar tack. We have leather in the knees and sort of the grip spot as well as my contact hot exhaust. Um, and then the in the boot narrow fit here. You can see that there is top stitching everywhere. In the, the bottom here, there's actually a pretty nice detail. It's, it's a bonded hem, so it's just rolled once. So it's as thin as it can possibly be and then just bonded. There's no stitching, so minimal bulking. Um, the other thing we did with these pants is unlike some motocross pants, it's actually a full length pant, not like a Moto Capri uh, that's cut around your calf to minimize bulk in the boot. This is a full length pant. So if you do uh, bring it on a trip, you can wear these um, out to a market, uh, out to dinner with your regular footwear and not look, um, not look like you're missing a little bit of your pant. Yeah, they're great around the fire. I mean, the, part of the thing when we started talking about this was the idea of like, you know, to be able to, you put on, if you're gonna go trail riding, or just a day dual sport or truck in trailer in somewhere that you're putting on your pants at the beginning of the day, wearing them all through the day until the end of the day. So you, you might, you know, put on these pants, go out, load up your bike, jump in your truck, pick up your buddies, stop and get a coffee and a muffin, go up, ride the trails, do your thing, come back, stop at a brewery, have a beer, have some dinner, hang out, catch up with some people, whatever you're wearing, you can, it's possible to wear these pants throughout that experience and not be like, Oh, I'm still in my like ski gear. No, yeah. it's really nice. You just pop, you just take your armor off and you're like so comfortable. Um, yeah. And then you can see on here, this gives you the material blocking. So the brown is non-waterproof and the black is waterproof, uh, breathable. Um, the seat, shoulder sea change membrane is really cool. We picked it because uh, shoulder has amazing uh, abrasion, resi abrasion resistant fabrics um, and also have stretch. And then the sea change is quite unique because as your body temperature rises, the pores kind of open up just like your skin. And so at higher temperatures, it's more breathable. Um, and at lower temperatures, it's more windproof. Our price on this is gonna be 300 bucks. And, and I happen to know our margins on this are actually unusually low. Our production cost on these is very high. What is the, what is the, uh, the driving, uh, what is the, their main drivers of cost on this van? Uh, the waterproof breathable. The sea change. Yeah. And that's because it partly because it's shoulder, right? Yeah, it's made in Switzerland. It's nice fabric. Yeah. 
Very hey, nice. Scotty, do you have on, on your screen while we're still screen sharing there, do you happen to have the rack? Um, we're, we're, so Ron, Ron bro asked us about some over the boot pants. Uh, and then Rusty actually also asked about over the boot rain pants. So this has come up a few times. So they just kind of want a comparison while we have the, the screen share up right now. Okay. Behind the curtain. Okay. So, <laughs> um, First off is our deluge uh, rain kit, which is like our ultralight packable, sort of more like an emergency shell. Um, which is available in, now. Which That's is available, available now. Um, it's a great piece. It's got uh, reinforced knees and lower legs. And then it's like a super light uh, event, three layer, 2020 waterproof breathable. Um, it doesn't pack into the, this little thing anymore. It packs into its pocket. That's just its pocket. It doesn't come with a bag. Um, so th that's our first one and it's great. I mean, if, um, if you're going on a trip and rain is very unlikely, but you definitely don't want to be caught out for, for the chance that it does move in, uh, the deluge is amazing. So, uh, that and John, so while we're on the deluge really quick, John Young, uh, asked if the knees can take a crash as well as the super fabric. The answer to that is no, absolutely not on the deluge. The deluge is like an emergency packable, forget that it's in your bag. If it starts sprinkling and you're out riding single track and you need to get back to your car. Yeah, the upper the upper material, which does continue around the back of the leg um, is, is super light. It definitely wouldn't want to crash in it. Um, the knee material, is a little more durable, but we mainly made it durable for like working on your bike, more sort of typical use that you would see with a rain pant rather than like being a, a preventative crash. Um, but we are about to, we are about to, if we didn't already introduce our uh, free repairs program. So yeah. that I think is dropped. I think Ames is actually on the chat. He can chime yeah, in Ames, and say, Ames we're live with that chat. though, right? The, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. So we're live. now doing, this was part of the I think everybody has the if same. Ames, if Ames is going to stick around, Ames, uh, I know you can hear us right now. So if you're going to stick around for the whole thing, you should ask, uh, you should get into the waiting room when we open it up and you can come on and tell everyone about it. So to the gentleman who asked uh, uh, about the, um, uh, about the, the deluge and the durability, you know, if you do crash on the pan or you do a muffler burn on it or something like that, we're going to start saying, you know, basically, even if it's your fault, it's not a failure of material design, we'll fix it for you for free. And that's, that's because, I think everybody worries about that. What if I crash on this thing? In reality, uh, most people aren't going to have that experience, but some will. And if we just can find a way to sort of take care of those people and build that into the, our base like economic level or economic model, then um, that would be a really cool way to sort of encourage folks or allow folks to spend a little more money on nicer gear and not have to worry about like destroying it on their first ride. Um, so uh, yeah. anyway, there's something that we're, we're introducing to kind of help with that issue. So uh, to use that as, as, a, as a gap the, or a, a segue, the, we had this, a similar conversation. We're like, well, the deluge is like pretty light. I don't know if I want to yeah. be bringing it as my only pant. Well, definitely not as my only pant. But even for that for a longer trip, like an international trip where you're going to be out for several months, um, bringing something so lightweight, it, like we said, it's more of an emergency shell. Um, so we wanted something in between the basilisk and the deluge, something that would still be like more packable, um, also still focus on mainly uh, rain protection and just a little bit heavier than the deluge, a little bit more durable. And so we came up with the rack. The rack is a true overpan. It's got full length zips up and down both sides. It's got a double layer seat and double layer knees and front of boot. Uh, so you have a little bit you have a lot more reinforcement than the, the deluge and a little bit less than the basilisk, which has super fabric there to protect the fabric as well. So this is our answer to that durable over uh, durable rain over pant. The, the, the deluge is designed to pack tiny and you can put it in your backpack and you'll forget it's there until you're out dirt biking and something starts raining. You're like, oh, sweet, I have those pants. This is the thing where you're like, hey, look, I want to do a long term. I'm going to do a BDR trip. I'm going to be traveling for a week or a month or I'm going to travel long distance around the world but I want to do it in non-waterproof pants so I can be more comfortable and I can sort of walk around and feel like I'm in a little bit more normal clothes. But when it rains, I got to stay dry. This is the pant that will survive that long distance trip where you might be riding for a week with this pant on, right? The deluge was never designed with that in mind. The deluge was your, oh shit layer. Hey, I'm out here raining. Hey, I'm out here. I wasn't expecting rain. Oh shit, it's raining. Put them on. And then as yeah. soon as it stops raining, you take them off. This is designed to really survive a long, long-term travel. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of great feedback about our design and warranty program. So, so that's great. That's exactly, we want you guys to feel stoked and taken care of. 
um, this gear should last. And what, while we're on this topic of the, the abrasion resistance, what about, what about comparing the basilisk and the new woodsman pant? Um, how do you feel Scotty about the, like the knees and stuff for guys who are crashing off-road on the spike, not, not on the road? Uh, I mean, we basically, the knees are, are like 500 D stretch, stretch nylon. Um, I mean, we've tested it, we crashed in it. Uh, we haven't had any issues and it took us a really long time to find a material uh, that was up to our standards. And so it's definitely not super fabric on the highway. It, it's not going to um, hold up the same way. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, what am I looking for here? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, nothing is going to be stoked. Right. Super fabric, yeah. super fabrics claim totally. to fame as being like the most abrasion resistant material, you know, kind of a, a man-made textile material out there. But uh, the, the, the Scholar, I mean, one of the reasons why we're working with Scholar on this is that Scholar has a, a sort of sub expertise in motorcycle uh, apparel and abrasion resistance. That's one of Scholar's claims to, claim to fame. So that's, yeah. that's part of why we chose Scholar for this application. In fact, this material probably has an abrasion rating. I don't know what it is. I don't know if you do. I don't have it on the top. Um, okay, we've only got a few does. more minutes to go through the kind of sneak peek. So um, I feel like that's pretty, we've, we've done pretty good with the woodsman. Should we introduce? Uh, are we looking next? at the rack too? Or are we doing the jackalot? Are, uh, are we doing the rack today? Maybe. I mean, if I mean, we, we can breeze the, through both of them, sure. We already did I think the we, pan. we got to open it up to people. That's one of the best okay. parts of the live stream. Right. You know, it's almost, we're well, three minutes from each Okay, block. We're also making an, an anorak. People saw that, uh, so it's going to be a pullover, waterproof, breathable. This is mainly focused on just weather protection. Um, so, for example, same as the deluge story, if you want something that's going to be a little bit more durable um, and be focused on rain protection rather than uh, abrasion protection like the basilisk, then the rack's your thing. It packs down about uh, two-thirds the size of the basilisk and a little bit bigger than the deluge. Um, so it's great. Um, waterproof, breathable, amazing piece. And this is one of our one of our goals for this was to have as few opportunities for failure as possible, as few zippers, as few vents, as few pockets, just to make this incredibly simple, totally bomb proof garment. It's just the stuff you need and it still packs down pretty small. And I've been amazed at how often I find myself reaching for this jacket when we go riding. I have a prototype of it. That's the one I used in Vietnam. I actually crashed in that one on the pavement. That's when I broke my leg and that thing actually held up incredibly well. These are obviously these aren't the actual colors that Scotty's showing you. The ones you see on the slide are the actual. If you want to see some good pictures, go to Pete's Facebook because he's got way better photos than I can show you on Zoom um, yeah. of the rack and people people can see a sneak peek there. Um, the other really piece. That. Yeah, go ahead, the other piece we're really excited about um, is our a great piece of insulation while you're on the bike, but also it's just a great around the town. Uh, jacket as well. So we are introducing a piece called the Jack Aloft. Um, it's basically an ultralight insulation piece. Um, it's got a center zip, two hand pockets, uh, two chest pockets. It folds up and, and can get stuffed into its own pocket. So it packs super small. And the really cool thing about this um, is that it's basically just top quality everything. It's 20D nylon face fabric. So that's pretty light. But on the insides where the real fun is, it's Primaloft um, gold aero, or sorry, wait, cross core. But what that means is it's got aerogel in there and aerogel is basically like the world's best insulator. Um, it was developed by NASA. It's like 95% air. Um, so it, it's just incredible insulation. Um, there's like very little transmission through it. So Primaloft found a way to integrate it into fibers and we use that, um, that insulation here. It's actually 52% warmer than the, the, the equivalent insulation from Primaloft. So there's Primaloft Gold, which has a really good R value. And then there's Primaloft Gold with cross core and it's 52% warmer for the same weight. Um, yeah. so you really notice it wearing this. I got to say, like, it's one thing to talk about all those stats. Uh, the actually the heat generated by this for the, the lightness and small packability of it is really impressive. And so this is a synthetic, right? We went with a synthetic on this. Full, fully synthetic. Bobby, can you stop sharing your screen? Sorry. Um, just because then we'll go back to gallery view. Um, I think right. it doesn't show everybody. Does it show Scotty while there we're looking at that? It does because I clicked the. I found, I just found a okay. setting for that. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, the jacket, I actually have it right here. I was going to wear oh, it. We were, the... we were in the airport on our trip. When we were on our way to our trip, Pete was wearing this through the airport. And he's like, God, I think this thing is like really warm. <laughs> Try it out. And he took it off and I, I put it on and we were like walking pretty fast on the walkway, uh, admittedly. I was like, try this on. You got it. It's it kind of crazy. It was really, it's yeah. very warm and it's so thin. You just wouldn't think that it provides that much uh, insulation. And, and I, it looks, it looks good. I love it. What I love about this is that it, it, you took this, you made this incredibly high tech insulating layer that actually almost looks and feels like a shirt and so you can totally i mean we're always looking to try to reduce especially on our backcountry trips where we're not doing a lot of like off bike time like maybe we go out to a restaurant or bar here and there but like mostly we're in the backcountry but it's really nice to not have to have your riding stuff and then your other stuff you know yeah. and this jacket like totally fills both it's just one less thing you have to bring and well, it packs it's also really great cool. because um people can invest in it. It's not, it's not just something that only lives in your riding kit. It can be like brought over into your daily life. You can wear it out in the garage, working on your bike. And that's then what we want. I mean, that's like the ultimate for me. Like the first time I've, I've seen people now riding with our gear, but like the first time I see someone in a grocery store with our gear, I'll be like, yeah, oh, totally. man, we that's did the it. shit. Yeah, we did yeah. it. Yeah. I think this is, and this is another use. The pricing was on the slide, $159 retail. This is a great example of what we were talking about earlier, where we were saying that, you know, the sometimes we get to the end of the process and the price is really high, but sometimes we get to the end of the process. And when we do put it through our math, the price is actually incredibly economical, like 160 bucks for this. And it's using the best insulation you can get. Uh, it's yeah. pretty wild, it, it, like insulation that's uh, actually expensive enough that a lot of companies don't even won't even use it because they feel like they can't hit their retail price points. We got to the end and it comes out at 160 bucks and we're like, holy cow, that's nuts. Yeah. What would an equivalent, where do you, are there some equivalents to this in other manufacturers lines right now? Um, well, the, it's, I don't know what the price on other cross core are cause it, it's, it's a pretty new product. And yeah. when I was just at outdoor retailer, there's a bunch of other brands coming to the same realization as, as we did that it's, it's a great product. And that's kind of, um, the capstone of their insulation line is they're like, they inched it up. So I don't know what the price point on, on there is, but mm -hmm. if you look, into my past at Patagonia, the Nano Puff, which is a very similar um, item. It has uh, a different collar, no chest pockets, but two hand pockets. Um, and then they use a Primal Loft in insulation as well. It is, uh, I believe they use silver because they're focused on the recyclability, but it retails for about like 200 or 210. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're at basically like the sale price you'll find at like end of season sales all year round. Um, with a better insulation that's 52% warmer. And what's interesting is Patagonia, because of their volume, has a substantial cost advantage over us. So yeah. I mean, that, that price difference is about what I would expect from the direct to consumer versus retail model. Uh, but that, but then you also have to take into account the fact that Patagonia is sourcing, uh, you know, they, they're buying with so much more volume, they have a lot more leverage. We also have 10 more, 10 more grams of insulation in the chest as well. It's also mapped, so there's 80 gram and then 60 gram. Um, so it's actually a little bit, thicker insulation as well. So that's another add value. I love this okay, jacket. Guys, yeah. a couple things we have to move on. So okay. number one, number one, let's talk about uh, the delays that we're experiencing right now. Um, just a quick note on that. And then when people can expect these new products that we just introduced, um, I've added people, uh, I've added the link for people to join the meeting. So they're going to start coming in. So let's move through these quickly, but that, and then what sizes uh, can people look forward to? What new sizes this year? Okay. So First off, to talk about the delays. Um, so obviously, COVID-19 is a global pandemic and it is affecting everywhere and it might be affecting different places at different times. But shortly after um, things started to ramp up in the US, it also started to ramp up in Bangladesh, which is where we produce our garments. Um, since about a month ago, our garment factories have been closed. And so we've been delayed a month. Um, we are originally planning to launch at Overland Expo or shortly before. And now it's, everything's pushed out about at least a month from there. So realistic timeline, we're looking at probably June, which is not the ideal time to be launching ADV stuff. But I think um, given, given the climate that it's not going to be the worst and we're fortunate to be getting it at all. Um, sure. So, so that's, that's the delays and it's really unfortunate. It's also a dynamic situation. So um, our factories are working to get back to work and 
um, we'll hopefully they'll be able to stay at work and, and keep this uh, virus curbed. Um, but who knows? This is like a whole new a whole new world we're in. Everything's different every day, and um, the mass impacts of this are, are going to be felt for a while. It's very hard to keep. Is, yeah, the yeah, safety, the safety is, is number one. We're like, yes, we want to keep bringing awesome new products to you guys, but first and foremost, we have to keep our team safe, and then our extended team, which goes out to our our factories, which we have and a very first, too. and our customers as well, which we have a very personal relationship with all of you and our factories. So that is number one to us before yeah, absolutely. any timeline. Yeah, we can all wait another month for our motorcycle gear. <laughs> uh, one, yeah. one thing, I just want to tell us. I mean, if we have to, we can press pause on 2020 and just get really <laughs> crazy in 2021. We're totally. going to start, we're going to sell hoping. out. We're going to be out. We're starting to start running out of the car all very yeah. soon. I, I was just looking at our inventory. We've already sold out. I mean, just on the Basilisk, we're getting down to, uh, we've sold out of some colors and some sizes. I, I think we still have everything except like XXL. In, yeah. in one color or the other, but pretty soon. Yeah, we, I think we're all out of uh, green jackets uh, in size large, maybe one of the sizes is in green. Yeah. So. Um, okay. And guys, just so you know, don't, don't be, I think these product development meetings are like, they are the shit. Everyone loves these. So I sure. think we have to just keep doing like when we, when we had wildcat Andrew on, we said, maybe we should just do one live product development meeting, like, uh, every month or maybe do apparel one month and then bags the next month and just keep ping ponging. Cause there yeah. is such a thirst for this. So we will, we will have another, sure. not to worry. Um, and let's bring our first, uh, first guest on. And then we will get to the sizing question at some point. Sorry. Okay. Uh, while he's connecting in here, sizes, we're going to be adding waist sizes. We're going to be adding tall. So we're going to extend our range out to include size 40 waist sizes. And then we're going to be adding talls to the 32, 34, and 36. So um, a total of four new sizes in our pants. And that'll be in all of our pants from the basilisk. Uh, Basilisk rack and woodsman, um, and I'll have to bite my tongue because it didn't that change didn't get applied to the um, Dalers, which has an elastic waist. Danimal, uh, what's up? Danimal, can you hear us? It says he did not connect to audio. Oh no! Here, oh, here he comes. Here he comes. <laughs> Maybe. Our... Hello, dude. What's happening? Dude, what's happening? What up? Sorry, I had some. I'm on my phone and I had some weird audio stuff. So yeah, it looks like you pulled over on the side of the road. Yeah, well, no, I'm in the driveway. We're pa we're we're painting some things outside, so. It's great uh, to see your face, buddy. Yeah, it's been a while. You guys too. Yeah, I look very different from. Uh, Whoa! <laughs> what the? Hell you're, yeah! You're pulling in Ashley, like. <laughs> Quarantine got a little weird, so I just was like, <laughs> "Let me know oh. if you need to touch up." I perfected the bleaching process last summer. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah, yeah. I like redid it, and my roots are like a little yellower <laughs> than the rest of the hair. But uh, okay, for everybody who doesn't know, this is Danimal. This is the weed animal. <laughs> yeah, it looks sharp. So, uh, I have questions. Yeah, what you got? Okay, so I uh, I kept losing you guys there for a little bit, but uh, start first with the woodsman pant. Uh, Scotty B definitely want to hear your opinion. So as a daily driver, good a good solid pant to wear all the time. Because for me, I'm not like a super experienced motorcyclist, um, but I'm definitely trying to get there and. Um, not too worried about like going down on the road per se, but definitely going to travel from my house a lot to single track, two track trails, uh, want something comfortable. I really like in the boot. Uh, I definitely don't like over the boot pants just because they seem bulky yeah. and I catch things. Um, so good daily driver pants to wear. Would you say? Yeah. I mean, I, I would take the word daily driver out of it. Cause that makes me think of commuting. Um, but, but for like your adventure pant, I think it's it's great. I mean, like I said, I just took it on a trip um, this last fall, and as well as some single track riding last last summer for testing. But like, this is a great pant. There's tons of airflow, so on hotter weather, you're gonna be super comfortable. If it gets really hot, you can open up the vents. Um, it's gonna do you fine in in like a a short shower or like through a stream crossing with the DWR plus the waterproof. Um, sure. So I, I think it's a great pant. I definitely would want to pair it with a, uh, with a rain pant, whether it's one of ours or something from like the backpacking market. Um, 
because then you're covered for all the conditions you're going to get in. Sure. Yeah. I've worn them around. I wore them into the office when we got our first prototype. And, you know, they're, they're uh, one of our original inspirations for this is actually some of the Fial Raven pants, the soft shell touring mm -hmm. pants. And I wore those for months. Uh, <laughs> Strictly. And, yeah. And I wore him. Uh, he went on a, he, he went, used to wear jeans every day. And then he like got rid of all of his jeans and just wore these pants strictly for product development work. One of my concerns with these was that the, uh, was that they, uh, because of the leg openings being, you know, because it's an in the boot, we can't add too much material down there. Like you, ideally you pull your boot off and it would like sort of blossom into a normal leg, but sure. that, that doesn't really work because then that material has to go somewhere when you put the boot over it and it can create little knots and be uncomfortable. But like, Actually, this pant, just given the trend right now of like sort of skinnier pants and stuff like that, I mean, you throw yeah. it on with a pair of hiking boots and they actually look kind of badass. They're like, they're sort of yeah. stylish. Yeah. Sure. I wear, I wear 511, so I, I'm totally fine with that leg opening. I'm like, this is perfect. <laughs> I, I wear 511s as well. And half the time, I mean, if I'm ripping around the neighborhood and throw boots on, you know, I'll just throw those on and, you know, you can't even get them over a boot anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, going back to fit. Going back to the Fial Raven pants, that's, I mean, I took a page out of Pete's book and, you know, bought a couple pairs of those just for comfort and yeah. hiking and, uh, and definitely have worn them. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a, like, you got buttons and you've got all sorts of material at the bottom that gets kind of pinched in your boots. So yeah. I found not to be super comfortable, but I want something that's kind of that design, you know, the, the kind of on the front of the thigh cargo pocket, um, still has that you know decent stretch but then also the fjall raven pants are definitely a thing too as a daily driver there's actually um internal sleeves in the pocket to that would keep yeah. your phone more on like the front of your pan or if you do i mean people yeah, are obviously split yeah. on the safety of riding with things in your pocket but i ride with my phone there and that's my choice um and it's really nice you can just kind of sl slide in it's not going to be junking around um bouncing around falling into the impact zone so that's really nice, especially as a daily driver for having some things handy. Totally. We, uh, uh, one you. I, oh, wait, sorry. One go ahead. Question. One more question. Uh, just the last question, because I got kind of lost there for a little bit. We're like, <laughs> the, uh, the stretch, how much, what, what kind of stretch are we talking about in the pants? Like, um, like so the black, the black stuff's four way stretch. Okay. Um, Let's see if I can show you. Is the crotch gusseted at all? Uh, the crotch is not gusseted. It's very, it's very similar, actually, to the Fial Raven pants, which um, actually very similar to some of our own pants. I think the Fial Ravens, some of them have gusseted, some of them don't. But it's not gusseted, but the stretch material. So on the black, you can see my fingers. And oh, yeah. Stretch. It's super stretch. Yeah. I, I keep like laughing while we're talking because there's so much chatter about your mustache, Danimal. Uh, it's like everybody's like, okay, is it 70s porn star or state trooper? I can't tell. So then they, Andrew decided that you were a state trooper who does porn. Oh, nice. <laughs> like, I would definitely, I definitely sway myself more towards the porn side than the state trooper. Uh, side. But only I with girls you everyone, like. Though, so. Only with girls you like, not for money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dude, it's good to see your face. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks for, Thanks for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. I always hate the part of kicking people off. That's the worst. I'm like, okay, you gotta go. Sorry. We have to get someone else in here. That was great. And I also have a hard time remembering like who joined the waiting room first. Hey. Only with girls you like. Nice, that was fast, Wade. Wow, <laughs> you what's got up? It, you got it before, hey, Wade. You're like, hey. <laughs> Dope. Wade Olson in the what's house. What's up, Wade? Scotty, what's up, man? I'm doing good. How are you, man? Oh, uh, you know, living the dream. Living the dream. The indoor dream. Yeah. The it's actually that uh, we're actually having this meeting because I literally just texted Scotty Friday about this. Yeah. So Scotty and I were actually talking this weekend about it. About what? Uh, I was like, wait, uh, did uh, I miss it? I was like, what the no, I was like, no, did I, I space out? <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, this weekend here, down here in San Diego, it was 85, 90 degrees. Um, so it's been really hot. And so I noticed somebody commented before about like a mesh or like warm weather jacket. 
And so Scotty and I were texting back and forth about ideas and where that would fall in the lineup and what, you know, ideally we would see that would fit in the lineup and what it would actually function like. Yeah. What do yeah. you guys come up with? So we were just kind of talking about it and it, it basically is an extension of the woodsman. And so it would be taking some of that soft shell uh, concept into a jacket and it would be probably a little bit slimmer fitting. Um, so you could also layer it with a basilisk and, and very cold weather. Um, and the idea would be to sort of like half step towards a, a true like mesh jacket. And that's just that, um, obviously for adventure touring, a mesh jacket is, um, you know, a very good statement that you believe the weather's going to stay nice. And I guess you can pack an emergency shell, but. I mean, I, I thought know. the whole point of a mesh jacket was just to hold your armor. Right. right. I mean, what's the point yeah. of a mesh jacket outside That's of that? That's what it, I was wondering. Why don't we just it, take it off? Did you make some pretty so amazing what the, um, mesh meshes that can can take a pretty good hit? So like so it's the abrasion. For, yeah, for the abrasion. So like if if you were riding in ninety degree plus heat all the time, right. even on the road, it's nice to like max out your ventilation, and so yeah. you can have some very abrasion resistant meshes that could take a highway slide. <laughs> Um, so that would be the appeal. Why wouldn't we put it in like a jersey? If we were going to use that kind of material, couldn't we do it as like a pullover jersey? And for, I mean, why would it be a jacket? You know, it's not, it's not very comfortable. Yeah, yeah. It, it's they're they're very they're very good at abrasion, but they're also very abrasive. Like you definitely wouldn't want it next to skin or like even on your armor. Like the way we wear armor. armor, there's like some exposed sections. Yeah. It's it's a design challenge. Um, and so I've been wearing around. Um, my Arcteryx shell the it's one of their climbing soft shells and it's great it like just cuts the wind like just enough to make it like like bearable but you can still fear the flow especially once you get up into higher speeds um unfortunately it has a hood on it um but I've been really liking it kind of like it's that half step when we were on our our cold weather trip actually I was having a like an issue I was a little bit too hot in a basilisk and I was a little bit too cold when I was just wearing my jersey and I, Granted, add some base layers on as well, but they were so ventilated that as soon as you started going, the wind chill. Mm -hmm. And so, really? ir ironically, a soft shell again would kind of meet that middle ground. It would block just enough wind, but it also would let just enough wind in. So, it's kind of a sweet spot that we yeah, talked about. One of, one of the things that you know we talked about was living down here. You know, I've got to ride 30, 40 miles before I hit any trail, and so. You know, in July when it's 95 degrees, you yeah. know, the basilisk is going to run me really hot till I get out to the trail, and I'm not riding in my jersey out to that trailhead. So I think that, and I think that's where we came to the consensus, Scotty and I, that the soft shell was kind of the answer. Was that mm -hmm. I think a mesh jacket is too specialized for only super hot weather, whereas the soft shell, you know, you can get some breathability but you still have a little bit of elemental protection that if it does cool up the 70s to the 60s that you're not just completely frozen at that point yeah so your main concern is your main concern i just just to be clear about that your main concern is that when you're you don't want to ride in a jersey and body armor on the road because you feel like there's not enough abrasion resistance is that what you're saying correct yeah so I you feel, want to I have feel it exposed out of there. too for sure i there yeah. are many times where i think of that and i'm also like if I know, as you said, Wade, like it's 40 miles, it's not that long to get where you're going off road. I'm like, oh, I don't want to go through the, I'm like, I don't want to stop enough to put my stuff on. So then I just ride, but then I feel like I'm riding like kind of weird on the road. Cause I'm like, hey, I don't want to crash. You know, I'm like thinking about <laughs> crashing and it's like, oh, it's, yeah. you know, it's just weird. I mean, I ride with a Jersey and body armor on the road all the time. And I, I know, I mean, obviously we, I feel like I have bet, much better impact protection than somebody who's got an integrated armor jacket on. But clearly, I don't have the same level of abrasion resistance, but uh, abrasion protection. But I also feel like I feel relatively safe. And I can't tell if that's just an illusion because the body armor is so thick and covering so much of my body. But like, I feel like I would, I would, I would survive a hit pretty well. Um, yeah. But that's Jersey a feel. definitely wouldn't, but the Jersey but. wouldn't. But I mean, I feel like somehow between the Jersey and the armor and everything, by the time I came to a stop, I'd be in pretty good shape, you know? Yeah. Um, depending on how long the slide was, but I, at the same time, I totally, uh, I totally get, I, I'm not sure that that's accurate. That's like a gut thing and I'm not sure it's correct. And also I totally get the desire for, um, for somebody wanting something that outer abrasion layer. I just wish it didn't have to be a jacket. You know? 
We're right. Make an interact for you. That's why I was thinking. One, of, yeah, one of the things Scotty and I would talk about was maybe a hot weather rack. You know, something that didn't have a collar, like yeah, tip, um, that had some stretch to it. I think that would be cool, man. I, I mean, a pullover. It's almost like a cross between a jersey and a jacket. Yeah. We talked or about an abrasion, abrasion resistant, uh, the workhorse. We talked about an abrasion resistant, you know, jersey. Yeah, um, but it wouldn't have the kind of. You have something we're working on, but that's more for like, I would say, like trail, trail abrasion, like really rugged, yeah. rugged use in that sense. I think what Wade's looking for is something across the gap um, just to get to the trails for, especially the big bike guys uh, in southern US. I think it sounds great. I think it sounds neat. I mean, and I think the cool thing about the soft shell is that then it's something you'd totally use off the bike or around the campsite. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have a lot of uses. So you wouldn't be like, Oh, I'm bringing this extra, like you like Wade said, or you're, I'm bringing this like specialized thing that has only works in this like really uh, uh, fine uh, uh, silo of sort of condition, yeah. you know? And what yeah. Cause I, I would imagine in, in like my, as I think about this and where this fits is, I would wear that soft cell jacket when it's nice or whatever. And then I would probably be packing the rack and the rack yeah. over pad yeah. with it as the supplemental. Mm -hmm. I can totally. see that. That'd be, that'd be a good combo. Yeah. We've got someone else on the. Yeah. I, uh, so I, Ames, Ames was going to join us and I was like, Oh, I'll add Ames, like another member of the Moscow team. And I thought he was on his iPhone and I don't know who this is. Cause it just says iPhone. And now and here. There. Oh, I think that's me. Oh, <laughs> oh that was fast. <laughs> yeah, name? Can you hear us? Yeah, are you talking to are iPhone? We're talking to yeah. iPhone. Talking, we're talking about are you iPhone? <laughs> yeah, what's oh, up, yeah. iPhone? <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I'm uh, iPhone 10. Uh, <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what is your oh, what is, my real name's John. John, yeah, what's up? John? What's happening, man? Where are you? Yeah, where are you chiming in from? I'm in San Francisco. I'm in San Francisco right now. Sweet. Awesome. And, Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm the guy that this is Roxy. What's hey, up, Roxy? Uh, I'm the guy that sent you the video. I'm the guy that sent you the video exploding the bag with the explosion. Oh, oh no, no way. way. Yeah, we had that. I wish we had that. Dude, that was so cool. So we have we have uh, this internal. A lot of people who are on the live stream probably use Slack. We use Slack at Moscow, and we had that in our Slack channels, and we were all just like, "What the? Oh my God! What can we do with this? This is so cool." That's awesome. Thanks for sending Should that. Did you post that? Did that go on our any of yeah, our yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Cool. Um, so so uh, you guys, are I'm, you I'm gonna lose my. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I've been. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know why my service sucks, but um, no, I've just been packing and working on my Africa twin because I'm not really working a lot right now. So it's been great. And awesome. Just getting ready for my trip. So um, I think I missed what you guys were talking about with using the deluge pant over the rack pant. That was like your recommendation, right? Deluge over the woodsman. Oh, the woodsman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the rack. You can do deluge or rack. Either one. Will yeah, but how's the if you're doing, say you were doing like a three year round the world trip. Mm. Yeah, then you'd then you'd want. I mean, if you didn't want to wear a waterproof pant all the time, then you'd want the woodsman pant with the rack over pant. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was about to and say. That's exactly what we designed it for. So if there's somebody who wants to do a trip like that. And 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 but do it in a more comfortable pan, not have to wear yeah. water waterproof pants every day for three years. John, we yeah. didn't really have time to dive into the rack, but um, maybe on our follow up uh, meeting that I that I um, just record and then post afterwards on our YouTube channel, we'll take some time to dive into that and give you guys a little preview of what the rack um, system is going to be, just a little bit more in depth. All right, perfect. Yeah, I'm I'm tired of sweating Badland pants, so. <laughs> right on man check out the woodsman is right. so, we're all in love with it everybody in moscow is wearing them all the time it's crazy we're wearing them on, on our dual sport rides we're wearing them on our dirt bikes i wore it really when we were moving into the house i was like oh i'm just gonna wear these for a couple days like yeah <laughs> they're comfortable around. cool all awesome right, thank you guys for awesome. joining we're gonna we're gonna yeah, cool. play with all love here right. in a couple of days. see you roxy see you john uh, see you wade <laughs> all right bye, thank wade. you bye guys bye wade see you wade
Okay. Oh God, I almost did it again last week. You almost kicked me out. Yeah, <laughs> dude, that was hilarious. I was like, oh, where'd Jeremy go? Shit. Uh, okay. And this is gonna be our last person uh, for the evening because, well, we've been going for an hour and a half almost. Now. What do you know? We got sidetracked on a product meeting. Yeah. What? Uh, JM, let's JM. I see you're in there. Let's catch up later, man. Yeah. Sorry, JM. Sorry, man. We're we're because of the time. Well, I'll, I'll I'll give you a call after. Oh, it looks like Ozzy. Did oh, unless not, Ozzy. Ozzy did not connect to audio. Ozzy okay, will hold, give you hang a, out, JM, for a sec. Oh nope, Ozzy's gone. JM, okay, hang JM, out. JM, and JM's gonna be our last. Sweet. Um, wasn't he the last? Wasn't he last the other night too? He was last on I think our meeting with Andrew. Yeah. JM. JM. There, right <laughs> on. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> It takes this. Oh, second. we don't have audio. Just yeah. give it a second. We don't have audio yet. Uh, people are asking a lot about while while we're waiting for JM to connect. Um, I'll just mention people are asking a lot about colors, like what new colors we have coming, and then um, size, which we kind of touched on. But um, but yeah, we're just gonna we're working on broadening our size. Right now. What's up? Hey, JM, what's up? JM, how's it going, man? You have audio now? Yeah, Wait, we do. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Yeah, you got me. Turn off the YouTube. Turn off the YouTube link. Yeah. <laughs> is it off? There we go. Yeah. We're okay. Good. Okay. It takes a second. This is that's actually the same technical difficulties I always have at the beginning of the meeting when we're actually pushing live because it opens. Yeah, I got to I got to turn off my. Uh... Yeah, yeah okay. I got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think we have it. Where are you? Are you still down at the beach in Thailand, or are you up? No, in no, I'm at home now. I just got back this weekend. You're in Chiang Mai. Welcome yes. Home. Cool, yeah. man. Hi, Scott. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah. What's new? What have you been up to? You've been out riding, or do it just kind of? Uh, you guys still under well, quarantine and lockdown there? Yeah. Okay. I went riding with my son yesterday up in the mountains. Yeah, it was it was great. Nice, that's great. Hey, JM, do you have any apparel feedback for us or do you have any questions that we can answer? Uh, well, given Scott's, uh, you know, vast experience with gloves. We can hear you, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we, can yeah, hear yeah, you. yeah, yeah we hear you. Whoops. And, uh, you know, I was wondering with, with uh, Oh, he still has the audio going. Yeah, you've still got you've still got the live stream open somewhere else. Um, okay, you, you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, just go ahead and ask. Okay. About the gloves. Given given Scott's vast experience with gloves, and I know he, he probably hates this question. You know, I'm always changing gloves. You know, while I'm on the ride, I always take at least two pairs, sometimes three pairs even, because you know, for riding on the road towards the trail, you know, I like to have like leather gloves. You know, but then mm -hmm. on the trail, especially here in northern Thailand. You know, it's too hot, you know, so it's either a choice between motocross gloves, which are very flimsy, mm -hmm. which don't offer a lot of protection, but with, which gives you a good feel. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the, 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 let's say, the adventure style or the, the gloves for riding on the road, which are too bulky for riding, you know, trail. So I was wondering if you guys are thinking of launching a glove line. Well, I like where your head's at with the glove product. Um, we, you know... When I first started, we had this like really like roadmap conversation of like what categories we we're gonna cover and what what was off limits, what um, what was like the focus, um, and and we definitely threw gloves up there and we we talked about some some concepts that aren't aren't too different, a little bit more uh, towards the weather protection and ventilation side rather than the impact protection, but um, but that was definitely gonna be be part of their that conversation. Um, but you know, it's just, we got a lot to say in apparel. So I would say gloves is a little further down the line um, for the foreseeable future, but it's gloves, are, gloves have some challenges, right, Scotty? I mean, it's a different factory uh, for one thing. It's a specialized factory, which means, it's, um, well, it's a different channel, which then we have to also maintain. We have to foster the relationship. We have to find the right relationship. Um, MOQs are also can be quite high because gloves are quite small. And so if you buy a certain amount of fabric that would make 10 jackets, it'll make 50 gloves. So MOQ stands for minimum order quantity for anyone watching and it's yes. hard to throw that term out. 
minimum yeah. order quantity. That's the minimum amount we can buy from a factory <laughs> for them to, you know, consider working with us. So, so those are, uh, because they're so small, you have to buy a ton of them to make, to meet your fabric minimums. Those are some of the yeah. challenges and, and definitely economies of scale benefit the big, the big dogs. Um, because just as you make a product smaller, it doesn't necessarily make it any less expensive because there's a lot of steps uh, in a glove too. So yes, a lot of so those are challenges. I have, then I have one more question. Uh, you know, I always wear knee braces uh, as, uh, you know, in, in comparison to knee pads, which are not as bulky. So are all your pads designed to be roomy enough around the knee area to wear, uh, you know, like quite bulky knee braces? Yeah, we, we, we fit all of our pants with the Liat, um, I can't remember which model it is, but it's asymmetrical knee brace um, with the rigid protection. They're quite okay. large, Dan. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're very, very bulky. Yeah. You mean the hinge, you know, you're talking about the hinged ones, right, JM? Yeah. 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 And like I said, you know, uh, I'm usually in, in the boot pants, you know, because, you know, my, my experience is mostly riding uh, off road. Um, and here in the jungle in Northern Thailand, you know, there, there's very narrow trails with lots of uh, vines and, and branches sticking out. So you don't want to get your, your pants caught up in, in, in these things. So I always wear in the boots. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on my last trip in the US, you know, I got sponsored by Gerne with the SG12 boots. Uh, and of course the condition was, although I was wearing a climb over the boot pants, I had to tuck them into the, the boots because you know, otherwise you don't see the boots, you don't see the logo and there was no, no, uh, no point in them sponsoring me with boots if you can't be seen and uh, the photos can't be seen in the magazine. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so I think your, your, your pants, you know, your uh, Woodman's in, uh, Enduro pants would suit me very well, especially here in Thailand where, you know, the climate is such that you need a lot of ventilation uh, and you need brace, uh, abrasion resistance. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, in that sense, you know, I'm in the market for, for those pants for sure. Excellent. You know, we'd love to have you try a set of those, man. I think that I think that'd be a great, a great yeah. for you. you know, the, the in the boot versus out of the boot. I, we're we're going to get an earful on this when we come to market with these bands because oh yeah, the, and the touring anybody that comes from a dirt background, like the kind of riding you guys are doing, the try people that come from track, the people that come from like serious enduro and trail ride, they're all in the boot. They get it. Like yes. the boot is designed to rub against the bike. The two go together. You know what I mean? That's and the way that we're supposed it to have. It looks better. It looks so much better. Like it really does from a from a style standpoint. Not that that matters very much, but it matters a little. Right? Yeah, but it's funny because some people. I, I agree with you. Uh, I think because some people feel like a stormtrooper. What? It is a little. People feel like a stormtrooper when you're going to the gas station. You're like, clonk, clonk, clonk. And I think that the in the boot just is it on it implies like dirt cred. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yes. And so for people who come from a dirt bike background, know that. And when they see the over the pant boot, the over the boot pants, they're like, what in the hell are those? Yeah. Whereas people who come from the riding side, the touring side, they're used to the over the boot, and they're like, they think that the in the boot looks like stormtrooper and like totally geared out or like a like an equestrian. Like they don't, uh, they don't get it at all. They're like, why do people do that? You know, like, why can't we just have a normal pant that feels like a normal pant? So, boy, whichever way we go, we're and gonna hear it. That's where the basilisk you know? comes in, though. I mean, yeah. they're two completely different pants, obviously, but yes. we will have a product yeah. offering in both, both areas. Yeah, while while I was riding my, uh, you know, BDR marathon, you know, uh, linking one BDR to the other, I could easily spot the people who came from a road riding background on their big big GSs and KTM's because they all wear over the boot pants. Yeah. And then you come across the guys on usually on the lighter machines and they're all in the boot pants, you yeah. know, uh, riders. So because they come from a dirt, like myself, from a dirt bike uh, riding background. And then, and like you said, you know, it's, it's two different worlds coming together in the adventure community uh, yeah. with, 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 with a different background. So, uh, you know, I'll, I will always wear in, in the boot pants if, if I can, you know, but, uh, you know, so. I'm, I'm actually looking at, at, at your uh, pants uh, section to see what, what would suit me the best, you know, but yeah, I travel all over the world. So I have to find something that can, you know, that can cover a large, uh, you know, range of applications. That, that's the 90% pan. That's, that's this one right here, the Woodsman. Um, I'm going to find it pretty hard to go yeah, back, back to a fully waterproof pan, just knowing that I can layer uh, I can layer for wind protection. I can layer for cold. I can layer for water protection. Um, when once you add in those things, um, because the deluge is so small, and you're already going to bring a pair of long underwear on colder trips for around yes. camp, all of a sudden 
your your range is is just ginormous. Yes, that's true. I think yeah, the I'm, style I'm, this the style uh, will also on this stuff is going to follow the function, you know. And so the function, as more and more of these riders that don't have the experience, like the people you're seeing on the BDR, start to get pushed into more and more difficult terrain and more and more aggressive riding and slightly lighter bikes. As that mm -hmm. happens what they find aesthetically appealing is going to start to match up with what the function of the riding dictates. And that's definitely an in the boot yes. pants. So you might be a little ahead of the curve on that, but it, it's time to start seeing some real in the boot touring pants. We yeah. had a couple yeah. of funny comments just now. So Jonah, our, our buddy Jonah said, uh, I have a, what did he say inseam? I have a, I don't want to say it wrong. I have a 29 inch inseam and over the boot pants make me uh, snag my leg on the peg and then the bike goes over. I was like, oh, that's happened to me a few times for yeah, sure. I can see that. Yeah, um, and that then happened, another that happened to me too. Oh, yeah, that's I mean, <laughs> I, you know, the times that I did wear my climb pants over the boots, uh, I got snagged on the foot peg and keeled over, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so. totally. And then, and then Mojo's dad said, clothing for ADV riders is confusing. It can be. It's Indeed. True. Well, we're mm -hmm. trying to simplify yeah. it, but it, initially it's going to get more confusing because we're doing a lot of really out of the box stuff, I think. But, That's but funny. I hope we're, I hope what we're doing is heading out in our own direction and just kind of making decisions that people are, you know, are very different from what the industry is doing, but that solve real problems for people. Cause they, they, we know we're solving problems for ourselves, right? That, I mean, that, yeah. that's part of it. And our sort of small group of people that are providing feedback on ADV Rider, we know we're solving a problem mm -hmm. for them. Whether that translates into this like much broader audience, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, totally. I mean, but ultimately, we're providing more choices. I mean, now now you can choose to ride in a non-waterproof pant that is designed to perform for what you need it for. You're not just yeah. showing up in a pair of jeans or something. Yeah. 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 One thing, one thing that's been brought up again is that, Hey, you guys should offer this pant. There's so much debate about the woodsman being in the boot, out of the boot, offered in both. And that's something I think like, once we have the confidence, once we know that this, this, uh, pant is received well by the community that people really like this idea. No one's ever done a soft shell dirt bike pant that costs $300 before. Totally. We don't know if anyone's going to buy it. So we gotta, we gotta see if people are going to buy it first and then maybe we can make both of those. And we can't double our, our MOQ. Yeah. We can't double our MOQ and then have two products that are either or so they're essentially cannibalizing each other in the marketplace yes. right. so we bought twice as many and they're cannibalizing each other not on a first launch you know down the road who knows hey jm it's great to see you we're gonna great to see you too guys we're gonna sign yeah, off thanks here. for tuning in thank and you it, so is, much for coming on is that Jan. your wife in the background uh yeah she's at their design desk you know she's a designer hi, hi. Designer, so. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i missed you when i was in chiang mai yeah we can't wait to meet you yeah, she she was in the U.S. when you were here, so. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Okay, guys, have a have a great day, night. I don't know what time it is there, but. Uh, okay. uh, Bye, guys. It's, uh, it's almost eleven uh, a.m. Ah, okay. Have a great day. See you. Yeah, we will. Okay. Bye. Guys, <laughs> um. So, guys, I think we. God, I'm like conflicted. We should. Everyone's asking about colors. So let's show. I'm going to bring Ames on so that he can give us the thorough. As we close out, everybody, I want Ames to tell us about the Warranty Crash Care program. And I think we should like sneak peek a few of the new colors. Um, all, all of the styles? You, why not? I mean, I don't know. Everybody's asking. They're badgering us for it in the comments. I'm like, we got to do it. I was trying to hold out, but I think all we right. have to. I'm going to bring I'm Ames. I'm ready if you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Let's see. So what are we pulling up? The uh, color styles? I'm, I'm going to show our <laughs> whole, <laughs> what we call um, whole virtual line plan. Oopsie. What's up, Ames? <laughs> oh. Is, is Ames on? Ames, are you with us audio-wise? Oh, no, he's, he's muted. Yet. He's muted. Unmute. It's okay. Go ahead, Scotty. Uh, yeah, Ames, we Ames, got you now. Can you you guys can see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. We okay. Can All right. So the, this is our entire lineup. Uh, we do have a few couple secret things we're working on that aren't on here uh, that we'll be hopefully launching around the same time. Um, but those are still in the works. So we're not going to share those. But this is uh, hopefully everything that we'll be receiving in June. And so you got the Basilisk with three colors. Uh, you got our sort of brand colors of the charcoal with cyan pops. You got a navy with black and these kind of like um, sagey green pops that we call lichen. And then we got this really like nice deep red uh, with these really bright uh, red pops. Favorite. Oops, sorry. And generally we're trying to, 
you these aren't what you would typically expect to see in the motorcycle like these aren't really moto colors these are kind of nature colors and yeah, I mean, everybody by the way we now have Ames Ames is our project manager at Moscow and we love Ames so Ames welcome to live streaming <laughs> what's up Ames? hey what's up guys this is very much my first live stream ever thank you <laughs> <laughs> So just to talk a little briefly about the not kit kit options, and then these are the pants that go with it. So you got black, which of course goes with everything. And we got this color um, called Tamarack. Um, and it's it's kind of like a gray, brown, green. It's, it's kind of a, uh, a chameleon color, like depending on what you put it with, it looks more gray, looks more green, looks more military, looks more um, sort of nature-y. It kind of moves around. And so it looks really good when you pair it with all the other items here. Um, uh, one thing I just want to mention, the jerseys, we don't have any new jerseys as of this moment. We might be working on something, but uh, these are just our jerseys that we launched with this last June. So that's nothing, nothing new. Nothing new and exciting there, but we're working on some stuff. But yeah, so you can kind of see how the line shapes up. Uh, this navy pulls through in the rack. The red pulls through in the rack again with those super bright sort of flame uh, color hits that are reflective on both both models. Um, the tar tamarack, sorry, is is coming through in the pants that you can get in the woodsman, the rack, and the basilisk. And then we add this canyon color, which is a nice sort of workwear tan and a really strong blocked uh, aesthetic as well. So those are our main colors, and then you can see them kind of continue down into the layering pieces. And so again. Navy and the red sort of being the anchors and then throwing in um, this lichen green, which is also the accent on the Navy um, with a little blocked shoulder. And so pretty earthy, super wearable. And then we also have some brighter things if, if you want those sort of like outdoor bright pops. But I think when you see that red in person, it's actually super wearable, nice and dark and rich. So good. The Jackaloft, if, if anybody's wondering where the name comes from, that comes from Jackalope, right? Which is a combination between a jackrabbit and an analog <laughs> and it's because the and the loft comes from prima loft and it's because it's a combination shirt and jacket so that's that's our that's a very it's a very convoluted naming story but that's that's where jackaloft came from i don't know it just kind of stuck i love <laughs> it it's, wondering. it's funky it's weird it's memorable hey ames you ready to take it <laughs> yeah give it a shot take it away, take it away. <laughs> okay uh <laughs> thanks for inviting me on here ashley um yeah, so let's see. I guess uh, you know, a number of months ago, earlier this year, we were we were talking about the fact that you know we make direct to consumer apparel, which is great value, but it's not cheap stuff. It's not disposable. It's not the type of gear you buy, you tear it open, and you just go buy a new one. And so that's that's a big impediment for people. And so we're thinking about how we can help folks out with that. And Pete was like, well, you know what? Why don't we, because this, this doesn't happen all that often, you know, you, you buy this great kit and it, and it works awesome. And then you have that unforeseen terrible accident or, uh, you know, you just managed to rip your pants open on a rock after you've just bought them. And that sucks. And how can we help people out with that? Um, and so, you know, it's it's a little bit like an insurance policy that we offer. And we, we, um, uh, we cover all of our uh, waterproof apparel for two years. Uh, from the date of purchase against unforeseen events. And so if you manage to uh, rip your jacket open unexpectedly, send it into us and we'll get it fixed for you. We'll get it back to you and get you back on the trail at no charge to you. And um, so I, th I think that's uh, that's something that's going to you know help a lot of people who are who are afraid to get into high quality riding gear actually get into it with a little bit less stress up front. So you know, even if something crazy all you just first day you just drop you touch the muffler or do something bad and you're just like dang it i just bought this nice kit uh that you know will take care of you you know it doesn't matter if it's obviously if it's warranty that's already taken care of no matter what but yeah this is something fun we can do in the apparel space that i don't i don't think anyone else is really doing anything quite like it and um and it's a way to just kind of like it's just the worst feeling it just you know just the other day i had i had a really nice knife i bought from this company oh, james yeah. in portland you know and i was like trying to pry some molding off of some drywall with it <laughs> really stupid but it was in like an attic and i didn't want to get up and go all the way to the shop and get a tool and so i pulled my knife out and tried to pry and i snapped the blade you know i was like oh dang it i love this knife you know and i sent them an email and 
they actually, it's kind of like our crash, crash replacement where they took care of me for 50% off. And I was like, I, I, it's just so, it was my fault and they knew it. And it was just this, you know, and they, but they took care of me, you know, and it was like, it felt so good. And I'll just like keep buying their stuff forever. And this is taking that to another level, you know, saying we'll do it for free. But, um, but anyway, I think it's a really crappy feeling. It doesn't really matter if it was our fault or your fault. Like if the thing didn't, you know, you get the thing, you, you pay, pay money for it, you expect to be able to use it for yeah. a certain amount of time and anything that falls short of that, regardless of whose fault it is, it's really disappointing. It sucks. And then you think twice about ever spending that kind of money again on uh, like, man, I just did it today. Like I snapped one of my plastics. I just replaced all my plastics on my dirt bike, like spent a bunch of money on all these little, you know, upgrades. And then I snapped the plastics and I was like, God damn it. I should have just left them the way they were. I'm never doing that again. You or know, sunglasses like yeah. sunglasses it happens you buy all new the time. sunglasses and you so just step cool. on them you're like i'm never it's, buying expensive sunglasses we're again. really yeah. excited to be doing this yeah thanks for, for for setting all that up ames yeah exactly and if you want to read more about it uh just click on the warranty link at the bottom of our page and that covers our warranty which hasn't changed and it also includes this crash care program and uh, you know as pete mentioned we've we've had a crash care program in place for a long time and that is the 50 percent off and and so we've expanded that you know, I've mentioned apparel, uh, but we've expanded it to luggage as well. And so, uh, you know, we work with companies that repair our gear. They do a great job. And so it's much more efficient for us to take care of that. And so now we're, we're even covering that cost as well. And so that's, that's all of our luggage uh, as well as our waterproof apparel. James, how is shipping, how is shipping handled? Yeah, right. So if you get it to us, uh, we'll fix it and we'll send it back to you. Uh, you know, international duties are involved and if we complete the paperwork right, it should be possible to avoid the duties and taxes because it's just a temporary trip across the border and back. Um, but if we do to run into a situation where duties and taxes are assessed, um, then you know we we do expect the, the customer to pick that uh, that part of it up. But we'll cover the repair as well as the return shipping. And uh, and I'd say also to any kind of world travelers that are out in crazy places right now and stuff like that, like we have a an extra special care for you guys mm -hmm. so if something happens in the middle of africa or the middle of south america initially it's a little bit overwhelming because you're like how am i even going to do this how, what about the shipping and all this stuff contact us we'll help you work it out we'll help you work it out we'll help you figure it out 100%. we'll get it we'll somehow we'll get you back on the road with functional <laughs> gear uh no matter what so if that happens to you and you're in some crazy place reach out to us yeah Okay, with that, we need to close it up. It's 8.48. I have to pee and we're all hungry. And all right. this has just been so awesome. I think I have the same exact feeling we had with Wildcat last week. We got to do this again. It's just so cool. Um, and everybody, I mean, we get so much good feedback. It's invaluable. And you know, Tracy McCormick, this is the last thing I'm going to say, then really we're signing <laughs> off. Tracy McCormick brought up the point that this is actually more personal. What we're doing right now is more personal than the in-person shows because we're so distracted at the shows. You yeah, know, there's like true. people coming in and out of the booth and it's like, you got to pay attention to this and you're looking over someone's shoulder because like, oh, so-and-so just walked in the booth and then some industry person comes in and you have to leave your conversation quickly. So, so we never are able to give people our full attention. And this is just like, I mean, we don't, I would do this till 10 PM, you know, if, if, if we could. So this is our undivided attention and we're just having so much fun. Thank you everyone for joining yeah, thank Scotty. You for Ames, thanks for being here. We yeah, miss you thank guys. You. Thanks Scotty. Thanks. Ames. Bye. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Yeah.